I'm an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my earlier 20s living in remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, the Yukon, and British Columbia. I have many odd, frightening, and bizarre stories that come from my time in the north, and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012, when I was 22, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in a provincial park on the Alaska Highway, four hours north of Fort Nelson and two hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. I feel like it's an incredibly Canadian thing to describe distance and time. The place I worked at was a campground in a provincial park in the Alaskan Highway, four hours north of Fort Nelson and two hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had beautiful natural hot springs, which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived on an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet, and driving four hours to Fort Nelson every two weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs, make some traveling friends and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground? Park facility operator, which was general maintenance and cleaning of campsites, gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes I had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You are aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away, and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. I was already on edge sleeping every night. The trailer next to mine was abandoned by the previous manager of the campground after his son had ended his own life inside of it. The previous manager had promised numerous times that he would hire a company to drive up from Fort Nelson to tow the trailer away, but that never happened, not while I lived there at least, and nobody seemed to care about it too much. I went into the trailer once, saw the remains of the previous crime scene, and never went in again. Back in the 90s, there was also a fatal bear attack at the hot springs. We all had to read the incredibly gruesome and detailed police report about it for our bear-aware training. So yeah, unsettling to say the least. One night, at probably around 2 in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and I'm awoken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed to see a car with its lights on and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. This is the moment I've been scared of the entire summer. Through the door I say, How can I help you? And one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say, Sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. And the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken, and I can tell they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically he says that him and his friend are on vacation, came up from Fort Nelson to party, that they had a really long drive, they were at the hot springs, they were having beers, and they were sorry about having beers, they weren't drunk, clearly, and then he drops the bomb that somebody is running around the campground, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and I notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, Someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, Yes, uh, somebody's running around stabbing everybody. And the other guy yells, C Come on, let's go. And they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door in the darkness alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone, and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger, and his cabin is about a five minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio, so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. 
His radio is off, of course. The only thing I can do at this point is to go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I slip out of my trailer and run through the darkness across the maintenance ground, through a thicket and straight towards the ranger's cabin. Every single noise I hear from the surrounding forest is making my heart pound faster. I keep imagining this maniacal man sneaking through the bushes, entering people's tents and slashing everybody like some bad horror film. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived, and I tell him the whole story. While I'm there, he calls the police and they tell him they are on their way and will be there in four hours. The ranger grabs his gun, walks me back to my trailer and says, Don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me. The intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze. My heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily, and I'm thinking, this is it. The knife-wielding maniac is going to end me, and this trailer is going to be another one they have to tow away. I'm just sitting there on my bed in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing, and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is, and I peer out the window of my trailer, and it's a freaking bison scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. Great timing, bison. The authorities get there at around 6.30am and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs and the entire campground turns into an episode of CSI. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group and booked it back to Fort Nelson, not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident, of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer. He was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friends stopped by my trailer to make it seem like they were innocent. Drunk logic, I guess. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. For many days following this incident, I was cleaning up blood-soaked clothing and rags from random places all over the campground. I was born and raised in Alaska, Anchorage more specifically, and had decided to start my undergrad studies in a small college town in Montana. Anyway, due to many financial pitfalls, my family and I decided that me moving back home and going to school locally would be our best bet. So the academic year wrapped up and my mom flew down to meet me for a road trip through Canada before re-entering the US on the Alaskan side. Of course, because I had intended on living in Montana for four years, there was a lot of junk in my car weighing it down, so I wasn't keen on speeding through on familiar roadways. The first day or so was great. My mom and I stopped here and there to do some shopping in a few larger Canadian cities. Overall, we made a point of traveling mostly during daylight hours, but during the early morning and evenings I usually drove. My mom had eye surgery a year or so before all of this, so her eyesight tends to not be so great at night. So on the third night, I'm driving us to our hotel in Dawson, Yukon, and things are going fine, but we are a bit behind schedule and it's getting dark faster than I would have liked. Somewhere after Stewart Crossing, we ended up with this complete jerk tailgating us with his high beams on. I'm kind of annoyed because I was already going nearly 10 kilometers over the speed limit, so I moved to the side and wait for the guy to go around me. I would like to point out that this was a single lane, two-way road with nearly no traffic. Despite me getting out of the way and waiting for this guy to go around, he seems to mimic my movements, staying right behind me even as I move almost off the road. By now I begin feeling this heavy, cold feeling in the pit of my gut, and my mom begins panicking. As I've said before, the woman's blind as a bat in the dark, and I was having a fairly hard time making out anything in my mirrors with this idiot's high beams blinding me. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a make and model of the vehicle, let alone a license plate number or anything about the driver. This all continued on for a while. I dropped down the speed limit, sort of putting my foot down and saying, if he wants to speed, he can go around, in a sense. 
Still, the tailgating and high beaming continued even as other people passed and flashed their high beams at the sky. We were maybe 10 or so kilometers outside of Arlington when things escalated. As we were getting closer to civilization, Arlington at least, my mom told me to just speed up and lose them. The driver suddenly sped up as if sensing I was now actively fleeing and attempted to ram us from the rear driver's side. It might have been sheer luck that they missed or that I accelerated faster than them. As all of this was happening, my mom was attempting to get a call through to emergency services, only neither of our phones had a signal. We have a local carrier and even in Montana the service was terrible. By now I'm easily breaking the speed limit by at least 20 kilometers per hour when the engine behind me revs up in the vehicle, a large SUV, I realize, zips around us and suddenly slams their brakes with their vehicle diagonal to us. I slammed on my brakes in response and nearly lost control as I drove almost entirely off the road. In the passenger seat, my mom is screaming hysterically, but I barely noticed at the time. In front of me, I could make out several figures in the SUV, only I wasn't terribly focused on much. All I remember was practically seeing red before shifting into reverse and hitting the gas before shifting back into drive and speeding forward. I nearly missed the back end of the SUV in the escape. After that, I wasn't entirely sure what happened. I was speeding off and the vehicle was still following, but further back. As we pulled into Arlington, they disappeared into some side street and my mom and I debated going to the police. We stopped at the first place with lights on, a hotel and my mom ran in to use the phone. I waited in the car, trembling from the rush and anxious in case that SUV was still prowling around. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe just some idiot teenagers who don't understand driving etiquette or how to drive around somebody. Maybe it was just some prank. I considered it might have been insurance related, but they seemed more interested in forcing me off the road than making me hit them. In the end, nothing was or could be done by the local police so my mom and I hurried along to Dawson, alone and slightly paranoid. When we got back, we agreed not to share this with my dad because he was already controlling and paranoid enough as it is. I suppose his paranoia is not without reason since if things had gone differently, I might not be here to share this story with you all. I'm a 25 year old male. This happened to me when I was about 12 years old when on a week long fishing trip with my family. I grew up in a small town called Two Rivers, Alaska, about 50 miles south of the Arctic Circle. I use the word town loosely because it was a 15 or so mile stretch of road in the middle of the woods about an hour north of Fairbanks, the closest town, with dirt roads and houses branching out along the road in the middle of a hilly and heavily wooded area. We had a single gas station and a laundromat, a cafe, and an elementary school, K through 8th grade, with about 50 kids attending in any given year. I mention all this because, based on this lifestyle, I was relatively ignorant of how bad people could be. Though my parents tried to explain this a little bit to me in tips to prevent being targeted by creeps. Don't talk to strangers, always walk with your back straight, chest out, and eyes forward to look less vulnerable. And if anyone ever tries to kidnap you, kick, scratch, and claw, and scream as loud as you can. I took this advice seriously though, I never thought I would actually find myself in a situation like this, so I became complacent. When this took place, it was the middle of the summer, in June. I remember it because it was Father's Day. The fact that it was Father's Day becomes relevant later. Summer in Alaska means 24 hours of daylight. The sun is high in the sky all day and night. The darkest it gets is when it gets low enough that it hides behind a hill, though the sky remains blue. And the weather is mild and pleasant. In contrast to winter, when we get three hours of daylight a day and it's negative 40 degrees. Me, my mother and father, my two brothers, 11 and 7, and my 11-year-old cousin went for a week-long camping and fishing excursion down in southern Alaska. Southern Alaska is absolutely beautiful with lush green forests and huge mountains. God's country. If you go down south enough, it becomes a literal rainforest. We drive about 200 miles south to an area called the Russian River. One intimidating thing about Alaska is you can drive hundreds of miles in any direction and not see any signs of civilization. It's just vast, beautiful, untouched and pristine wilderness. The last frontier. 
We arrived to the river at around 3 in the afternoon and immediately set off to catch some salmon. We parked the camper in this parking lot camping area on a hill and set up our tents. We hiked down this trail through the woods that zigzags down the face of the hill, similar to a goat trail, but with railings. From the tip of the hill you can hear the babbling river and can see parts of it through gaps in the trees, but as soon as you begin walking down you are immediately engulfed in thick vegetation and tall thick trees, spruce and birch primarily. When we arrive at the bottom there are combat fishers everywhere. For those who don't know, combat fishing is close quarters shoulder to shoulder fishing people up and down the river fighting over the same fish. Sometimes if you snag one, a person will actually grab your line, cut it, and run off with your fish. And there can often be fist fights over fish and spots along the river. When people see someone with a fish on, crowds of people begin to stampede to that area in an attempt to catch on themselves, or see if they can get an opportunity to steal it. It's weirdly intense for what would otherwise be a relaxing activity. We find our spots that aren't too crowded, feed our lines, attach our lures, and begin fishing. On my side of the river it's a small gravel bar, a slight incline, and a main trail mostly covered in a thin tree line where people can walk up and down the river, and then thick vegetation going up the hill where the camps are located. On the opposite side, a steep embankment and more thick wilderness, no trail, no camping spots, nothing. Just hundreds and hundreds of square miles of forest on the other side of this river. A few hours pass and no luck for anyone not even a nibble. I hear the occasional shout of fish on and then the sound of dozens of feet stomping through the water towards the voice. We can see the fish everywhere but still not so much as a nibble. It was about 8 p.m. now and everyone had given up by this point and decided to call it a night. However, it was Father's Day and I was still determined to catch a fish from my father as a present. I was on my own, however, there were still quite a few people around scattered up and down the river. Still not having any luck, I pick up my net and pole and move a little further down the river in hopes that being further away from the main crowds, I'd have all the fish that managed to get through all to myself. I was a little wary of being that far away from people, however, because every so often I can hear some rustling and crunching in the woods across the other side of the river. And in southern Alaska, there is a dense population of grizzly bears, so I made it a point to make sure there are at least some people around me just in case a bear decided to come lumbering through and get in on some combat fishing too. Grizzlies, though huge, are often just as afraid of us as we are of them. Unless spooked, she has a cub, or we are in the way of their food, which most of us were here in the river. I'm slowly wading through the river attempting to just snag a salmon in my net at this point, having crap luck with my rod. Now I'm so focused on my goal that I don't notice that it's now one in the morning. Holy crap. Since the sun never set, I had lost all track of time. I had been in the river for hours. The other thing I hadn't noticed was that I was concentrating so hard on catching a fish from my dad, I had wandered away from everyone. I look up and down the river and there is absolutely no one in sight. Not even the distant sounds of talking, walking through the water, or the sound of a line being cast. The only thing I hear is the babbling of the quick moving water around me as it was wading in the middle of the river. I begin to feel anxious and uncomfortable which is unusual because I grew up in the woods. I begin to get tunnel vision and concentrate on any sound that might come out over the sound of water. I hear nothing until a rustle and the cliché snap of a twig. Any experienced woodsman will tell you the only thing that snaps twigs in the Alaskan woods are bears and people. What was worse was the sound that came from in front of me up the embankment on the opposite side of the river, where no one should be. I look up the embankment on the opposite end of the river, about 25 feet from me, and I see a blonde tuft of hair in the brush. I stare at it for a few seconds, not entirely sure of what I'm seeing, nervous though that it's a bear, until the hair begins to rise, and so does the hair on my neck, as I see that it's a middle-aged man standing from a crouched position, obviously hiding, trying not to be seen. I would rather it be a bear. Wouldn't be the first time I've run into one. He has bright curly blonde hair, pale skin, a beer gut, and a bright pink hoodie which seems odd for someone to be wearing in the middle of the Alaskan woods. He's staring at me, and I'm looking back at him. Hey there, boy, he says in a gargled rough voice partially drowned out by the sound of the river. Hey, 
I say back nervously, but trying not to sound it. I see you have a net there. I could really use that. All I have is a pole. It's my dad's. I say back. Where is he? You shouldn't be alone out here. Lots of bears around here. Come on with me. I have a secret fishing hole just on the other side of this river through the trees a bit. There's a lot of fish we can both catch together. We can take turns using your net. Yeah, right. I'm thinking. I'm not a moron. There's a small maintenance bridge just down river, he says. I keep looking at him. The thick forest on either side starts feeling more like tall, foreboding walls, trapping me here with no other soul in sight, just me and this man. Meet me there, he says suddenly and sternly. Me being the shy and self-conscious type at the time, I stuttered and just said, All right. He backs into the tree line where I can only barely see him and begins watching me as he walks down river. I had said okay in hopes that he would just walk away without looking back at me, but since he was, I slowly start making my way towards the bridge. I'm not stupid. I know this isn't right. He was obviously trying to remain unseen before I spotted him. How long had he been following me? Skulking through the woods, watching me and waiting for me to wander off by myself. There should be no one on that side of the river. I haven't seen anyone on that side all day. He's still walking just ahead of me on the other side of the river, looking back from time to time to make sure that I was still coming. He turns away and I immediately bend down and pretend to tie my shoe. I look up and wait for the first second that he's out of sight, and I do a 180 and begin walking back the opposite direction, looking for someone, anyone, so it wouldn't just be me and this freak. I look back and my heart sinks into my stomach. The terrible tingly feeling in your stomach, like butterflies, but the butterflies all suffer from severe anxiety. I see the man standing in the middle of the bridge, staring right dead at me, seemingly peering into my soul. I can't quite see his face, but I can sense his intense agitation. I don't know why this creeped me out so much, but he raises his hand and begins waving at me. I turn away and keep walking, feeling his gaze drill right into me. Finally, I see a couple just up the bend of the river. I jog and get up close to them and I continue to fish, still determined to get my dad a fish for Father's Day. I should have just said forget it and made the walk back to camp, but no, I continue to fish. The crowds of people are severely thinned out at this point, lots of distance between the few remaining people and the occasional couple holding hands walking down the trail or along the river. Then, it happened again. Again, I got too focused on what I was doing that I hadn't noticed that yet again, I was all by myself. I'm an idiot. I didn't notice right away I was too enthralled in fishing, concentrating on where the fish are located and where I should dip my net since the bending light through the water is misleading where the fish actually are. But my almost trance-like state was suddenly broken by the loud thunderous sound of something stomping and charging through the water getting close to me. My first thought was, oh, a bear. I look up and see a flash of pink and blonde. It's the man, and again, I'd rather it have been a bear. I feel a hard pressure on my arm, and I feel the collar of my shirt get yanked up, choking me. I thought you were going to share your net, he says, oddly calm, but at the same time I can hear and feel the predatory aggression in his voice. I'm being dragged through the water towards the other side of the river. I can't keep my footing, and I can't pull away from his grip. I knew I should scream. I needed to scream. In my head, I desperately wanted to scream, but I was frozen and confused. It just happened so fast I was still trying to process it. Yet it all felt like it was all happening in slow motion at the same time. It felt like it wasn't really happening at all. Even if I had tried to scream, I was being choked by my shirt to the point that it burned and I didn't think anyone would hear me over the rumbling river. I just went limp, like I played dead, like that would work, blankly staring off. I still don't know why that's all I did. Secret spot's just over here, you little idiot. You will love it. I promise. There's tons of fish for us. He says with an increasingly aggressive tone. No one will find it. The tight grip on my arm began to ache, yet I was still clinging to my fish net and fishing rod. I remember just staring up at the sky. The edge of my vision was circled by the tips of the trees. The sky was a very dull blue and white, 
No clouds in the sky. I don't know why this visual stands out so prominently in my memory, but it does. Hey, bear! I hear this lightly echo through the river. Hey, bear! I hear it again, then a series of loud claps. I suddenly feel the man's grip loosen and I fall completely submerged in the cold water. I inhaled some because he dropped me so suddenly. I get up and begin coughing up the water I accidentally drank and I see a group of people coming down the trail through a gap in the tree line, about eight of them, walking with a sense of urgency like they were on a mission. Then I see one of them as my mom and I hear her yell my name. I grab my net and quickly pull my pole from under the water and begin walking towards the trail. I look back and the man is nowhere to be seen. He seemingly disappeared, though I assume he quickly hopped up on the opposite embankment he was dragging me to when he had heard people coming and ducked out of sight. I join the group relieved and decide that I'm done fishing tonight. It's not worth being potentially dragged off by dirty Q-tip looking curly-headed creep, the last thing I see being that stupid pink hoodie. It was 3 a.m., the sky still bright. It turns out that my mother had gotten worried I hadn't returned from fishing yet and that it was so late, so she sent my brothers and cousin with a walkie-talkie to go and look for me. They scoured the trail for about 30 minutes and they suddenly came upon a mama bear and her cub. They contacted my mom on the walkie-talkie and told her they ran into a sow and her cub. My mother, rest her soul, went into her own mama bear mode and in order to protect her own cubs, grabbed a rifle and as many people in the neighboring camps as she could and they set off on the trail to find my brothers, cousin, and me. They just happened to stumble upon me first, but we found my brothers and cousins soon after. We made our way back to camp, and I sat by the fire for about 30 minutes, thinking about what all just happened. No one saw the man, and I never told anyone what happened, maybe embarrassed that I did nothing to fight the man off. So even in the Alaskan woods, you never know who may be watching you. When my dad was in his early 20s, he and a friend of his took a spur-of-the-moment trip to Alaska, mainly because they were young men who couldn't afford to go anywhere else on vacation. Both of them were British, which meant they stuck out like a sore thumb wherever they went, this being rural Alaska and all. The two of them had traveled around Europe before, but had been used to doing so through the use of hostels, where you essentially walk in the night of your stay to book a room. I think they're pretty common in Europe. Why my father thought the Alaskan wilderness would be the same way, I have no idea. Because of this, they hadn't planned on booking a hotel ahead of time and were left high and dry when they arrived. They ended up getting around by hitchhiking with all their belongings in their backpack. Granted, this was the late 70s so hitchhiking wasn't as dangerous as it is today. Still a kind of stupid idea though. I think things started to get dicey around a week into their journey when they found themselves getting farther away from civilization and people became less willing to give them a ride. At some point, increasingly desperate, they accepted an offer from a man who said his name was Dave and drove around in a large cherry picker truck. Dave said he worked for Cable, I'm unsure if he actually said Cable, I do know that it was a well-known company where driving around in a boom lift wouldn't be out of the question. My dad and his friends started picking up some weird vibes from him pretty quickly, but then again, anybody working out in the boonies like that is bound to be a little strange, so they ignored their gut. Dave had agreed to drop them off at a motel he knew of, but insisted that they stopped at several bars along the way. Seeing as he was their only chance at spending the night in an actual building, they consented to this, albeit with some reluctance. Around the third bar, all of them were a little tipsy, and at some point my dad and his friend lost track of Dave. Eventually, after a thorough search of the area, it became clear that him and his cherry picker were no longer on the premises. Oops. This was a big problem, as they had left their backpacks in the truck. So, along with most of their money and belongings, both of their passports were gone. Double oops. I'm not sure the specifics after that point but I do know they managed to find somebody to take pity on them and drive them to a police station where they gave a description of Dave and the name of the company he worked for. However, when called, the company responded by saying Dave was not an employee of theirs and his truck did not match the description of the kind used by their company. Despite the department's best efforts, they couldn't track him down. It was like he vanished into thin air. 
My dad and his buddy were pretty bummed to say the least, but did end up contacting the embassy to solve the passport issue, got some money and ended up staying in the middle of nowhere Alaska for the rest of their vacation. I believe, however, that the best part of the story happened around five months later. Back in England, both of them had recovered from their miserable experience where they received a phone call from the people who had helped them solve the passport problem. Someone had anonymously returned their backpacks to the sheriff's department of the town that they had been abandoned in. Every single item was accounted for. Passports, money, clothes. Not a single thing was missing. They could only speculate that Dave may have been attempting to lure them back to his home with the collateral of their belongings, and based on his strange personality and the lies of his stories, it wasn't outside the realm of possibility. But they were thankful he seemed to have a change of heart, return their stuff, and it never escalated any further. I grew up on an island in Alaska and I lived on the same property since birth to high school graduation. Our house was two stories and the downstairs had a bathroom, furnace room, storage room, entryway and rec room. One of the walls had some plywood pieces up so you could feed extension cords through it to our crawl space. We had a C-shaped driveway that you would enter from one side then park in the carport and then just drive forward to exit. The crawl space consisted of two big water tanks because we caught our own rainwater and we would also use this area for storage. The space was 10 by 15 but only 3 feet high. You had to lift a cover up to get into the water tanks. You could only enter the crawl space from the side of the house. It was a 2 by 2 door that we kept a master lock on but never actually locked it. Our dog Brewster's area was on this side of the house as well. He had a big fenced area, his own stairway and porch which was half covered and he had a dog house. Brewster was a Weimariner chocolate lab mix who weighed 130 pounds and was a fantastic dog who only barked when necessary. During the summer we had black bears in our yard most nights and Brewster would give a quick bark to get them on their way, and we knew his barks. There were four of us in my family, my parents, myself, and my older brother who was two years older and has Down syndrome. My brother was in special education at school and there were other kids who would come into the same room but once in a while throughout the day because they had smaller disabilities and were able to keep up in some of the general classes, but some of the kids had discipline problems or mental illnesses. My brother was loved by the kids in the school, and everyone knew him. One day a native kid that was about 15 came to our door and wanted to play with Travis. We thought it was odd because Travis had moderate downs and he didn't really like playing with other kids. He liked watching kids play though. Travis liked watching movies and listening to music. My mom asked the kid what his name was and he said his name was Mark and he knew Travis from junior high the year prior because he would go into Travis's class sometimes for help with his schoolwork. I remember him staring at me a little too much and he didn't seem like someone who was mentally challenged. My mom let him come in but kept a watchful eye on him. Travis seemed like he didn't want him there and my mom told Mark we were having dinner soon and told him it was time for him to go. My mom found out he had moved into the area where we had lived but it was still a little ways away. He had been in and out of foster care most of his life and his parents were abusive addicts. I think he came over another time and my mom felt bad for him but she felt something was off. She felt like he was coming over because of me. My mom politely told him that Travis didn't really like having visitors and he seemed okay with that and never came over again. My parents went to a church service on Wednesday evenings and would be gone for a couple of hours. I would stay home with Travis. At the time I was 11 and he was 13. I started helping out in the church nursery when I was 9 and when I turned 11 my best friends and I took a babysitting course which included CPR and first aid. We would babysit together and at age 12 started babysitting on our own. My mom was a homemaker and was always home except for Wednesday church service. My parents didn't drink, do drugs or smoke. I can only remember my parents going out a few times where we needed a babysitter. I would leave the downstairs door unlocked for my parents when they were only going to be gone a couple of hours. I was expecting them home in a half hour and was surprised when I heard the downstairs door open and I thought I must have heard the car pull up and Travis was up past his bedtime, so I quietly tell Travis to go to his bedroom and get into bed. I start walking through the kitchen to the top of the stairs and I call out, Mom? Dad? And I hear the footsteps stop and I am looking down the stairs and I can see men's work boots and jeans. 
This isn't my parents, I thought. The way the stairs were set up, you could only see the bottom half of someone without descending the stairs. I'm scared to death, and I run to Travis, who is going down the hall, and I grab him and drag him to my parents' bedroom, because it is the only room that locks, has a phone, and rifles. Down's kids are very stubborn, so my brother just wants to go into his room, but I get him to sit down on the bed. I'm trying to keep him in the room while I'm grabbing a gun and trying to call my neighbor. I can hear him walking around downstairs still. My neighbors answer her phone immediately and I whisper someone is in my house. I'm scared. She told me to come out into the front porch and she'd be there. I get the courage and run to the door and get outside. Thankfully she is in our driveway and has her own hound dog with her. She lets me know that she is going to enter the house to the downstairs. She disappears from sight but comes back quickly and tells me that the door is locked so she makes her way up the stairs. She gets to the top when we hear the downstairs door open and the crunching of gravel as the intruder is running off. She lets go of her dog's leash and the dog chased the person into the woods. The dog came back 10 minutes later and our neighbors sat with us until my parents got home. The police were never called because I think my parents assumed it was a neighbor boy just messing with me and we lived in a safe place where you just had to worry about bears and the occasional wolf. A week after this incident, our dog would bark 15 minutes after we went to bed, every night. We would look out the windows and never saw anything. We figured it was bears because it was springtime and Brewster was probably just getting used to them again. A couple of months the barking still happened. I had my best friend stay the night and we would always stay in the downstairs so we could be louder and stay up as late as we'd like. Kate had a brother that was 7 years older and we asked if he'd bring us some booze. I know we were young, but that was the normal thing for our town. Kids started drinking, smoking, and doing other things in middle school because of boredom, I think. We got 13 feet of rain a year, so we would be inside a lot. It was a little after midnight, and her brother never showed up, and Brewster never barked that night either. We were sitting on the stairs, braiding each other's hair, and we both got a feeling like someone was looking at us, and we looked over, and a guy was staring into the window. We ran up the stairs in a panic. We thought maybe it was her brother, but he wouldn't have came to the window to spy on us, and the face seemed too dark to be his. But we had the lights on in the downstairs, and there were no lights by that window outside, so it was hard to tell who it was. We didn't wake our parents up just in case it was her brother. We waited 30 minutes and went back down to grab our stuff, and went to sleep in my bedroom for the night. The next day we talked to her brother, and it wasn't him. That night, Brewster was back to barking again. Two more months go by, and I had gone to bed and heard Brewster bark, and I looked out my window, and as usual, didn't see anything. I had just dozed back off, and I woke up to Brewster barking frantically. I look out my window, and I see a guy running out of our driveway. I thought about waking my parents, but we had a trail on the side of our house that kids used to get to the road behind us. The neighborhood was on the side of a mountain so all the kids used trails to go straight through to another road instead of using the main roads. I'd never seen someone come out the other part of the driveway because the trail was on the south side of the house along with the crawl space and Brewster's area. My room was the only room on the north side. I decided to go back to sleep and I was tossing and turning. Fifteen minutes go by and I smell smoke. I go to the hall and the smell is a lot stronger and is starting to get hazy in Travis's room which was directly across from mine. I scream fire fire wake up. My parents are up and Travis doesn't want to get out of bed but thank god for the strength of adrenaline. We get outside and flames are pouring out of the crawl space. We get Brewster out of his enclosure and the neighbors all come out to help us. The firemen were there rather quickly but the fire had destroyed the crawl space and my parents and Travis's bedroom because they were directly over the crawl space. The firemen got the fire out thankfully and nobody was physically hurt. This was one of the scariest nights of my life though. I will always remember the fire chief kneeling down to speak to me after he had talked to my parents and he said, Melinda, we believe it was arson. I looked at him with tears streaming down my face and I say in anger, who is arson? Everyone started laughing so hard, and I'm thinking, how is this funny? That arson could have killed my family. So he explained what arson was. I am still friends with the old fire chief's son, and I share that story with him often because his father passed away from cancer when we were teens. His father is the only happy memory I have from that horrific night. The island I grew up on had a city and a village out south. 
We lived out south, but before the village. We had firemen for out south, north, and the city. We had state troopers for the island and city cops on the city limits. My mom took my brother and I to our family friend's house and my dad dealt with the fire officials and a state trooper showed up later. After the investigation, my family, neighbors, and firemen pieced together that a person had been living in our crawl space for at least four months. We know he set the house on fire on purpose. He used a box of matches. My mom said the first odd thing she noticed that night was the smell of sulfur. We also know who did it. It was Mark. His uncle was one of the firemen who first showed up at our house and saw him standing near our driveway watching. My mom had told him my description of what the person was wearing that I saw fleeing from her house, and it was what he was wearing. Behind her house near the crawl space area, my dad found out where he would hang out when he wasn't in the crawl space. There was a bunch of cigarette butts, cans of soda which were also found in the crawl space. But because our crawl space wasn't locked, our insurance company wouldn't have paid for the repairs. Because of our water tanks, the space was supposed to be locked. So my parents never said anything to the police, and the firemen never said anything either. By pursuing this, we could have not had a home, a house my father had built. It took four months for our house to be repaired, and it smelled like ozone even after years later. What bothers me the most is knowing he had seen me and my friends undressed numerous times while changing in the rec room during tons of sleepovers. Where he had set up shop was right next to the plywood with the holes drilled through. He listened to all of our secrets. I never explained to my friends that he had seen us or heard us during our sleepovers because I didn't want them to feel sick to their stomachs like I did and still do. I still have issues when it comes to being home alone. I can't sleep if I am the only adult in the house. I keep the volume on everything very low. I am scared to shower. I like to be able to see the front door and I have night terrors to this day and I am 34 now. I have been dealing with anxiety since the fire and panic attacks since I was 18. Just recently I was diagnosed with PTSD. When the intruder was in his early 20s he was caught for burning down a few houses and was finally put in jail. All of my childhood toys were stored in that crawl space, along with a lot of our family's sentimental possessions. Hi friends, if you enjoyed these narrations, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where for $1 or more a month you'll have early access to all future narrations 24 hours before YouTube, ad-free. And be sure to send your creepy experiences and stories to letsreadsubmissions at gmail.com, and you might just hear them in the next video. Thanks so much, and I'll see you again soon.